If you are seeing slow or even stalled weight loss during your GLP-1 journey, then you are definitely not using them correctly. When I run into these patients on crazy high doses, getting wrecked by side effects, and in many cases, nowhere near their ideal weight, I only wish I had a chance to meet them sooner. If you want to get into the rhythm of smooth, sustainable weight loss while protecting your muscle mass during your GLP-1 medication journey, then you're gonna need to pay attention to these four things that we're gonna talk about in this video. What are the main reasons why you would start your GLP-1 medications and the results aren't happening? The results are slim to none. If you guys don't know what the deal is, my name is Dr. Jones. I coach thousands of patients in our community. My medical practitioners prescribe the GLP-1 medications and I do the lifestyle intervention coaching. It's an amazing opportunity for me because I have over 20 years experience of helping people with lasting weight loss in a clinical setting over the last 10 years. I've seen a lot with my protocols, but just the last five years with GLP-1 medications, I meet with the medical practitioners and they're always interested to hear from me like what I'm seeing with the patients when we're doing the dosing. And I'll tell you guys right now what I can say without a doubt, what we're able to accomplish with proper lifestyle interventions alongside GLP-1 medications. The coolest thing ever is being able to see people stay on lower doses and get amazing results. And watching so many other patients who just really don't get the lifestyle in, they're not taking it seriously, the fasting, the weight training, the supplements, the approaches towards nutrition where we like to go lower carb and, and just eating cleaner choices of foods. The reality is the ones that don't do those things or really don't take it seriously, they're having to utilize much higher doses. They're getting wrecked by side effects. They're having a very unpleasant experience. I'm just without a doubt convinced that you got to do lifestyle alongside with it. And I've always said that even before the medications in order to achieve lasting weight loss, you got to make permanent changes. So I don't think that should come to a surprise to many of you, but for the people doing the medications and, and getting this journey started, I could really summarize into categories the reasons why you would start these medications and not achieve lasting weight loss. Number one, insulin resistance, which is really creating the real problem, which is hyperinsulinemia, chronically elevated insulin levels. And we're gonna get into a deep conversation about each and every one of these, but I just wanted to kind of start off by letting you know what to expect. Hyperinsulinemia, chronically elevated insulin levels. Number two, inflammation. It's the inflammation, while it does go hand in hand with insulin resistance, is really its own roadblock and needs to be considered and approached in its own category, although they do go hand in hand. So number two is inflammation. Number three is thyroid. Hypothyroidism is an entirely different category, like all these different things that I'm getting into with you. With hypothyroidism, I must include the starvation mode, the weight loss plateau, the metabolic downregulation, although that's sort of a secondary subcategory, in my opinion, should be included in the thyroid category. So that's going to be, that's category number three. And then finally, cortisol. We can pair with that sleep because lack of quality sleep really in of itself is a stressful event to the body. My gosh, every single issue that I've come across, because we get so many people that come to our program, they're coming to us because they've seen my content, they watch me live or they see my videos and they're looking for help. They're starting these medications. They're either ramped up to the maximum doses and not getting results, or they've started, had some results and, and plateaued very quickly. Whatever it is, they come to us for help and just about almost over 95% of the issues, the roadblocks to GLP-1 weight loss can be put into those four categories. So I wanna get into these categories. I wanna break it down for for you guys so that you have a good understanding. I want to explain a little bit more about the mechanisms for each of these categories and provide you a roadmap and a solution all within this single YouTube video. And of course, I have singular videos throughout my YouTube page where I take a deep dive into each one of these topics. So it would behoove you to check those videos out and learn more for yourself, but an overview so that you guys can wet your whistle into solutions for GLP-1 medication, roadblocks to weight loss. Instead of starting with the ones that you guys, especially if you know me, that I talk about the most, I talk about insulin resistance the most, hands down, because truthfully, I think it's the most important thing to talk about. I think it's the number one out of all four, the number one most common. You gotta understand, each one of these can be a complete roadblock to any of you guys watching the video. But if you asked me which of the four is going to be the most common problem, it's always gonna be insulin resistance. So that's why I spend the most time talking about it. But I will talk about the lesser discussed ones first. So we have stress, thyroid, and inflammation. So let's start with thyroid, and then we'll get into stress and cortisol. Hypothyroidism, you guys probably heard about hypothyroidism. This isn't the first time you guys are hearing about this. This is a real full-blown medical condition 
hypothyroidism, a condition in which your body doesn't have enough thyroid hormone. I could be more accurate and say enough thyroid hormone activation, and you'll all explain why I specifically reference thyroid hormone activation as opposed to just having enough thyroid hormone. What is the thyroid hormone? What is its function? To put it in perspective, there are trillions of cells in the human body. Every single cell in your body has receptor sites for thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is considered one of the master hormones, rightfully so, because it is the activation of the thyroid hormone on each one of those trillions, not millions, not billions, but trillions, it is the thyroid hormone activation on each and one of those cells that's responsible for the conversion of the food that we eat, because the food that we eat gets broken down through many different processes. Eventually, the smallest substrates, the smallest broken down parts of the food that we eat eventually enters into the cell and into the mitochondria, the mitochondria being sort of the powerhouses or the batteries, if you will, of each cell. The mitochondria converts those broken down particles of food into the energy that our body utilizes, ATP. And ATP is stripped of one of those P's, the phosphates, and it gets converted into ADP, sometimes even AMP, but depending on what particular energy utilizing processes is going on at that time, high energy demands, more explosive activities might strip it down to the AMP, but mostly it's ATP into ADP. And then there's processes that convert that ADP back into ATP. And it just continues to go on. The electron transport chain is the very, very process that we're talking about in which the mitochondria houses all sorts of different electron transport chain reactions taking place, where that food is entering into the electron transport chain, being converted into ATP usable energy. Well, the activation of that on the cell surface is thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone is responsible, all of that in summary, for the very energy that our cells need. And you are alive and the result of trillions of cells working in harmony together. And so very important, <laughs> this thyroid hormone activation is. And so just the symptoms of hypothyroidism alone, difficulty losing weight, brain fog, lower levels of energy or exhaustion, constipation, feeling cold, achy body, hair loss, brittle skin and nails, and the list goes on and on and on. These are just rattling off the top of my head, the most common symptoms. We got a huge problem in the healthcare system when it comes to thyroid, mind you, because our very testing for thyroid is not that it's inaccurate. I will disagree with the statement that our testing is inaccurate. Our testing for thyroid is just not inclusive enough. So let me explain. We don't even test for thyroid hormone in a standard panel. In fact, what we're testing for, you might've seen it on your panel called TSH. So TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone is a precursor, if you will. The brain makes thyroid stimulating hormone, pituitary gland specifically. So TSH reaches the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone. So we're not even testing. We're not even testing you for thyroid hormone, but 60 to 70% of people out there your thyroid hormone activity can be accurately predicted by just what TSH is doing. So based off of what TSH is doing, we can detect the potential hypo or hyperthyroidism, hyper being overactive, hypo being underactive, which is what we're talking about as a roadblock to sustainable weight loss. Unfortunately though, there's a large population of people where TSH does not do what we would expect. And therefore you could have the presentation and the issue of hypothyroidism but TSH, we're looking at it, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, and so you won't get diagnosed as a hypothyroid situation. TSH being elevated is what tells us that, okay, thyroid hormone must be low, the pituitary gland is making more TSH to stimulate the thyroid gland to make more thyroid hormone. So you're progressing towards hypothyroidism. And if you're working with a specialist or an endocrinologist or hormone doctor, they'll probably start doing more specialized testing for you. But a lot of people, TSH looks fine. And yet they have the clinical presentation. Just Google, my doctor says my thyroid is okay, yet I have the symptoms. Do you have half or more of those symptoms that I laid out earlier? Then you probably have hypothyroidism, or at least you may have it, and it's worth further diagnostic testing. So what's going on? Well, in order to understand why this is happening, we have to get a little bit of a better understanding of just how the thyroid, how the whole process works within your body. So the main thyroid hormone produced is called T4. So T4 is, it's an active thyroid hormone, 
but it is not nearly as active as T3. The thyroid gland does make a little bit of T3, but not that much. The majority of T3, which is significantly more active, about 100 to 200 times more active than T4, your body relies on the conversion of T4 into T3. T4 is made, T4 is converted into T3. That is responsible for the majority of your metabolic activity in the body. A lot of people watching this are underactive in their conversion from four to three. So TSH looks fine, yet you feel like crap. You have all these symptoms because you're not converting. And you wouldn't catch that without doing a complete thyroid panel, which is including TSH and T4 and T3, free T4, free T3, which free just means the unbound and we don't have to get into the difference between bound and unbound for the sake of this video. So a comprehensive thyroid panel is crucial to accurately diagnose many of you. And look, starting your GLP-1 medications, if you're in that category, this can be a complete roadblock. Even with GLP-1 medications, you might start losing weight, but as you're continuing to increase your dose, you can't override the fact that you have a very low metabolic activity due to having low amounts of T3 in the body. So that's a big portion of this, you know, 30%, if you will, people who don't get diagnosed when they have a normal looking TSH. But the other part of it is reverse T3. Reverse T3 sort of blocks, can block the activity of T3. Normally you have a certain amount of reverse T3 in your body and that's normal, but during certain stressful times in your body, reverse T3 can elevate. And so when you check that and you see that it's elevated or lab high, that in a functional world, we know that that look for an infection, look for high levels of stress. If it's not lab high, but it's functionally elevated, we know maybe not infection, but there's something stressful going on. And that's gonna lead me to talk about the starvation mode and weight loss plateau situation in a second. So the reverse T3 is high. And so now you could have completely good looking T4 and T3 on the panel, right? But if you're not checking reverse T3, that's another situation where you won't get diagnosed as hypothyroid, yet you have the symptoms and you have the issue and you won't likely achieve lasting weight loss. And so we gotta have the reverse T3 as well. And you have to be working with clinics and, and practitioners that understand how to check this out and, and make sense of it. So reverse T3, final smaller, but still happens a lot category. You're working with a clinic like ours or, or somebody that understands what they're doing in the category of thyroid, what's the solution? You likely need to be prescribed like an NP thyroid or an armor thyroid, which is a desiccated product that has not just T3 and T4, but T1, T2, T2, T3, and T4. It's got all active metabolic components of thyroid hormone, which just from my own personal observation tends to work really well. And in some cases, you might even need a, a pure compounded blend from the compounding pharmacy, a specific ratio of T3 to T4. That's something my clinicians are much more versed in than I am. I'm just, I just learned from what I've seen, but they're the ones that are actually prescribing. So we, we gotta have in summary, a good diagnostic starting point and then a good solution, which is the accurate prescription. There's no way around it. Look, the only way around it is the second part of what we're gonna get into, which is the weight loss plateau, the starvation mode. So the weight loss plateau situation in which you are actively attempting to lose weight, you are exercising, you're dieting, you're doing your thing, and the weight loss slows down. What's going on? I've made plenty of other videos talking about this particular phenomena, so go check that out. But essentially what's happening is metabolic downregulation. So metabolic downregulation means the metabolism has actually been cranked down. Now, it's not actually a decrease in the production of T4 per se, but it's a combination of less conversion between T4, T3, and an increase in the production of reverse T3. So the net result is metabolic activity decreases. You feel like crap, you're in starvation mode, you're in zombie mode, it's no bueno. And so in that situation, you don't wanna override that with more thyroid hormone because more thyroid hormone will just increase the production of reverse T3. You gotta fix that situation. You gotta look for reverse T3 dropping. And this is what I call a reverse diet or a reset where we slowly work with you to increase your caloric intake over a three to six week period, say 200 calories every single week. And you know, a lot of people really enjoy the fact that you can work with my team uh, and myself to guide you and help you achieve the progress through that. Cause it's always scary when you're trying to help somebody through a weight loss plateau, cause you're telling them to eat more. And it's like, oh my God, I gotta eat more. And I don't wanna eat more. And if I eat more, it's like, I'm gonna gain weight. It's like, you might gain weight. That's a potential consequence, but we, we know how to 
you know, we know how to, how to, how to ride this and most often not actually cause weight gain. Just, just to be clear. Okay. So we covered thyroid. We're good there. Let's cover cortisol. Cortisol, stress hormone. Cortisol dysregulation, elevated cortisol levels as a result of stress will completely derail your progress. Why is that? Mainly because as cortisol levels are elevated above normal, you have elevated blood glucose and elevated blood glucose means elevated insulin and chronically elevated insulin levels. That's the other reason, the hyperinsulinemia. <laughs> we have to address that. We have to, we have to fix that. Now, this is where it gets tricky because testing for cortisol, testing in blood is not really that accurate. If you really want to get down to be objective with this, you want a four point urine or salivary test. I like the salivary. It's easier. First thing when you wake up early afternoon, late afternoon, evening, closer to bed. And what we know about cortisol is it's got a rhythm over a 24 hour period. Right before you uh, wake up, it starts to rise. It, it peaks right there in the morning. That's elevated cortisol natural. That's sort of why uh, one of the reasons why blood glucose is elevated. Cortisol and glucagon is the other hormone that's responsible for elevating your glucose levels in the morning. Mind you, by the way, this is why intermittent fasting just makes so much sense because you, you already get a release of glucose in the morning. You don't need to eat in the morning. I saved that for my other videos. You don't need to eat in the morning. Then cortisol is supposed to come down and it has this rhythm, right? Every single day. This test is nice because it can tell you if there's certain parts of the day where you're having a cortisol spike, maybe every day at 4 p.m. when your boss walks into your office. No doubt, I've seen stuff like this, by the way. Because <laughs> it's the person can, you as an individual might be able to just think about it and pinpoint where the stress is in your life. Great, that's where you start. Pinpoint the stress. But the test is nice because it can help you try to pinpoint where the stress might be. It could be a physical stress, it could be a mental stress, whatever it is. You gotta handle the stress. So handle number one is target the stress. Number two, okay, you identified what the stress what the stress is, where it's coming from. You need to reorganize that stressful activity and make it less stressful. Some of you guys, it might be your job. It might be your marital or relationship situation. It could be your relationship with your kids. Who knows what it is? I get it. You can't quit your job. You can't divorce. Or maybe you don't want to. And that's a whole other conversation. You can't divorce your kids, obviously. <laughs> that's why I say reorganize the activity to make it less stressful. And I'm not here to tell you guys my opinions on how you can improve your relationships. But I can tell you this, communication is the solvent to developing more affinity. Any relationship, social relationship starts with communication. That affinity, which I define affinity as just desire to be in someone's space, right? Whether it's romantic or whether it's, you know, family and familial, you got to have affinity. You got to have love. High levels of affinity to me is love and communication is that solvent. So get in communication. That's the first way to defuse a situation and then, you know, take it from there. There's something to be said about letting yourself cool off if you just got into an argument. Absolutely. I think that's important. Let yourself cool off. But once you've cooled off, stop avoiding the situation, get into communication, reorganize it to the best of your ability. Let's say you've done that. Let's say you've reorganized the situation to the best of your ability. That's like putting a massive amount of water over a fire. Okay, great. Now, how do we continue to heal? Adaptogenic herbs are very, very powerful. And you should start the adaptogenic herbs from day number one. So my favorite supplement, and I'll, I'll link to that, or you can shoot us a text message on our number. I'll link to this in the show notes. Adaptocrin from Apex Energetics. It's a nice product. It's got ashwagandha, holy basil, rhodelia, uh, panic ginseng, take it in the morning, about three pills a day. This adaptogenic herbs are nice because they increases your body's stress tolerance, right? It, your body can cope better because of what these adaptogenic herbs do. So absolutely take it in the morning during stressful times. I don't recommend taking ashwagandha for life. And, and I see so many people, so many supplement companies and people pushing them because it's a fancy word and some people feel better. And so companies are like, yeah, just take it every day. But in my opinion, no, no, you should save stress herbs, adaptogenic herbs, four times when you need them and don't take them when you don't need them. That way they're beneficial when you actually need them because you don't develop a, a tolerance to them. Adaptogenic herbs are nice. You reorganize your activity and then you implement some stress management techniques. There's so many. <laughs> There's so many stress management techniques. Mindfulness, breath work, journaling, meditation. There's all these stress management apps out there too as well. Just go to the app store and type in. There's so many. Just pick one. And this is what I tell my patients when we start coaching them. Pick a singular stress management technique. For me, I love breath work. I do breath work. I try my best to do it every day before bed. 
doesn't happen. I probably average five days a week and it's just five minutes. I put my phone on the five minute little alarm and I sit there and I breathe and I just breathe and I focus on my breathing. And trust me, my mind is always racing. And so every freaking 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, I'm grabbing it and I'm bringing it back and I'm just focusing on my breathing. And you don't need to overthink that. But if you prefer a guided meditation or any of those apps, just do something consistently. Try it for a few months. Let me know in the comments what you think, but very, very powerful. Like those adaptogenic herbs, giving the body a better coping potential. And with stress comes a lot of sympathetic tone, meaning the part of your nervous system that's excitatory, fight or flight, which is, is great when you need it, but should not be activated all the time. The other part of your nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system, this is your rest and digest and relaxation. You need that. And so we're trying to just improve that ratio because if you're chronically in stress, you're very sympathetic. Bringing up to balance that parasympathetic tone is what we can get out of this situation with handling stress management. And look, guys, if you're not getting enough sleep, this is the same thing. It's creating this cortisol issue. And so adaptogenic herbs can help you, but improving sleep. And I have so many other videos about sleep, seven to nine hours of quality sleep. That's what you should be focusing on. And that should be the goal. My favorite supplements to help you if you're not getting that to get some immediate improvement in your sleep. Pure Encapsulation's best rest formula, glycine and magnesium threonate. But I love magnesium threonate so much that it's just part of my core four supplements anyways. Adding the glycine and adding the Pure Encapsulation's best rest formula is going to be very, very potent to help you as you focus on implementing some sleep strategies. Check that video out if you are struggling with it, but sleeping on a schedule is huge. Like, in fact, that's actually, believe it or not, the number one thing you can do to improve sleep quality is simply having a bedtime that you adhere to and a wake up time. And the second thing would be having a routine that you do before bed preps the body because the body has this internal clock called the circadian rhythm and anchoring that circadian rhythm by having consistent bedtimes and wake up times set that and anchor that circadian rhythm so that your body does have an accuracy, an accurate sort of schedule. And it can plan certain things of which it needs to plan based off of what time it thinks it is. So very, very powerful to anchor that circadian rhythm and sleeping at the schedule can do that and it'll improve your quality of sleep. The cooling your temperature off is a massive thing. <laughs> Just realize as you do that, you will become a little bit more dependent upon cooler temperatures because your body does become accustomed to it. So I personally sleep at 64 degrees, but the research shows about 66 is gonna be good. 66 to 68 for most of you watching this, whether that's from an AC unit, whether it's a local AC unit, whether it's one of those bed jets or, or, or Uller pads, something that you can do to cool off your environment will help. Blocking as much light as you possibly can with those blackout curtains, blue light blocking glasses, putting your phone on airplane mode, avoiding as much exposure to EMF as you get closer to bed. And just relax, just relax. I have an alarm clock that goes off because my bedtime is 10 p.m. And so I have an alarm that goes off at eight that says bedtime incoming <laughs> and it's sort of just like a cue for me to to realize all right i need to stop with the stressful stuff and i just need to wind down that's the time to wind down so i wrap it up if i'm in the middle of a project i start turning off as much lights around the house as i possibly can and i just relax and that makes it easier when i finally do hop into bed around 9 30 9 45 to just drift off to sleepy time inflammation and insulin resistance, right? This is what we have left. Inflammation is the second most common culprit that I have seen when I'm coaching patients can be a primary roadblock. So how do you know if you're inflamed? Well, it's easy to tell if you have an inflammatory condition or if you have an autoimmune disease, for example, like Hashimoto's being the most common autoimmune disease. If you have an autoimmune disease, we know straight up you're inflamed. If you have food sensitivities like um, full-blown celiac disease, or if you just know that you react to certain foods, certain triggers, where maybe you become more tired, more brain foggy after you eat certain things, you're reacting. If you have any of those kind of situations going on, then likely there's some inflammatory processes going on. And inflammation, similar to insulin resistance, it'll put your body into more of a fat storage mode and make it more challenging for your body to mobilize its fat stores. Not only that, I mean, inflammation is at the base alongside insulin resistance as a progression towards most disease. And you'll see a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction and you know mitochondria is sort of the, the batteries of each cell 
And we talked about the mitochondria earlier because the thyroid hormone activates the cell. So we're starting to see a pattern here, <laughs> a pattern of the harmony through which all these things, you know, they work together. If we think you have inflammation, if you feel like you do, most potent thing that I would recommend you consider is low dose naltrexone. This is specifically for autoimmune cases, inflammatory conditions, post-COVID. Naltrexone is an FDA approved medication for alcohol recovery addict, narcotic uh, addicts that are recovering. But low dose is a, a fraction of it being used specifically for this case that we're talking about. It's a powerful anti-inflammation as well as it modulates the immune system. And that's a big deal because when you're autoimmune, essentially an autoimmune case just means the immune system is dysfunctioning. It's erratic. It's targeting tissues for destruction by producing antibodies. You know, antibodies are like the flags waving to the, for the military to come in and, and destroy. Well, creating antibodies is the first step. And then Finally, the, the big guns come in and wherever the, the flags are, that's where they're firing. And so we want to calm down the immune system together and being able to modulate it, which in this case means calm down, is what low dose naltrexone can do. By the way, thymus and alpha-1, which is another peptide, is also very powerful at doing just that. So LDN, thymus and alpha-1, really, really good for autoimmune inflammatory cases, Lyme disease, PCOS, menopause, potentially, depending on what's going on very much so PCOS. Outside of those more extreme cases, we have just general systemic inflammation, curcumin and resveratrol. Curcumin and resveratrol are the most potent, in my opinion, anti-inflammatory supplements. The data is very clear on curcumin and what curcumin can do for the body, just like low dose naltrexone, massively decrease inflammation. We put our patients on that, you know, tell them to really, really dose that curcumin, even to the point where they're getting a little bit of looser stools and then they decrease that dose, really, really help dampen the inflammation. Finally, that brings us to insulin resistance. And, you know, insulin resistance is the number one culprit, the thing that I feel like is the damn basis for obesity. It's the progressor towards diabetes. It's the progression towards obesity. You know, insulin resistance is when your body is not responding to insulin as well. You know, insulin's job is to shuttle the nutrients into the cells, the calories, the protein, the fat, the carbohydrates mainly. People think about insulin as just, <laughs> just carbohydrates, but it's actually protein, it's fat, it's carbohydrates, it's all of it. It's shuttling it into the cell. It's a storage hormone. Insulin is very, very potent at storing. Growth, 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 store, store, store. Well, that's okay because in a healthy situation, even if you're eating all the time and eating sugar all the time, it's a short-term rise, a transient rise, right? You eat, blood sugar rises, insulin rises, blood sugar goes down, insulin goes down. So over a 24-hour period, even if you ate sugar six to eight times a day, over a 24-hour period, the percentage of the 24 hours is low. Blasting with insulin is one of the causes of insulin resistance. We're gonna get into that, but the resistance sets in. Well, the body's gotta do something because if it doesn't, the blood sugar levels continue to rise. And so what does the body do? The body has to produce more insulin. So now we're needing more insulin to compensate for the decreased function of the initial amount of insulin because of the resistance. So now it's taking more insulin to get the job done. Insulin resistance ultimately leads to a condition called hyperinsulinemia or better understood as chronically elevated insulin levels. So insulin levels being elevated all the time, even when you haven't ate. And that is very pathologic. That is very problematic because our bodies were not meant to have this powerful hormone doing its thing 24 seven. Grow, 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 grow. Store, 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 store. By the way, this is why we're seeing so many, I, I think, just side note, GLP-1 medications are the first medication that we've ever had that gets to the root cause of metabolic disease. It gets to insulin resistance. Most of our medications, you know, think about blood pressure, cholesterol and blood sugar, diabetic medications. They're getting to downstream symptoms of an upstream problem, which is insulin resistance. We never had a medication that does this, right? That's why we're seeing after obesity and diabetes, we're seeing a whole laundry list of amazing benefits of GLP-1 medications, autoimmune diseases, GI issues, cardiovascular disease, fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, chronic kidney disease, the list goes on because insulin resistance is not a symptom. It's a cause. Again, that's why I talked about earlier about insulin resistance being the starting point and the most important thing, but it's, it's why I talk about it so often. But getting back to insulin resistance and this being a roadblock. So you probably have heard of this diabetes, for example, being doctors think of it as a chronic irreversible disease, right? You become pre-diabetic, then you become diabetic, 
then you need a little bit of metformin, then a lot of metformin, then a second medication like sulfonylureas, for example, and then an increased dose of that, and then maybe a third medication. Then finally, you're progressing to the point where you need insulin. First, it's a little bit of insulin, and then it's more insulin, and it's more insulin. This is why many doctors consider diabetes a chronic and irreversible disease. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's bullshit. That's not. Many functional practitioners will tell you we've helped patients reverse obesity and diabetes all the time. Not easy. It's a chronic disease, obesity and diabetes. It's very challenging, but it's not irreversible. Now that we have GLP-1 medications, it really helps. It really gives us a better chance. But we still have to do aggressive lifestyle interventions in order to fix it. If we can rule out inflammation, if we can rule out cortisol issues and stress, if, we, if we're sleeping really good, if we can rule out thyroid issues and you're not in a plateau or starvation mode, then this is the focus. This, is, should, this should be your focus. You're taking the medication, right? Well, what else can we do to improve insulin resistance? Hands down, two most potent things you can do. Fasting and a low carb diet. Why is that? Well, when you think about what causes insulin levels to elevate, right? Well, what causes blood sugar levels to elevate? It's what we're eating. There's only three types of food. Categorically speaking, as far as macronutrients are concerned, which is the different types of calories, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And compared to carbohydrates, protein and fat are very negligible. Protein more than fat. Fat is very low. Fat's the lowest. Carbohydrates are the highest. And within that category of carbohydrates, ultra processed carbohydrates, refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup are the worst. But carbs in general, ketogenic diet is a diet in which you're not eating carbohydrates, right? You're, you're going as low as you possibly can and replacing it with healthy fats if you're doing the ketogenic diet. Right? dirty keto and not ideal. You'll lose weight, but it's not, not ideal. But what's even better than a ketogenic diet? Fasting, right? And that's what I've created is the flow protocol, F-L-O-A, fasting like our ancestors. I created structure where structure was missing in the world of prolonged fasting. We get our patients into a rhythm of fasting for 36 hours plus every single week. Now, before your head spins, Trust me, using a GLP-1 medication in combination with powerful peptides like AOD-9604, so much easier than you could ever imagine to get into this rhythm of long fasting. So take a deep breath with me. You'll be able to do it. We have helped thousands of patients accomplish this. I can promise you that the reason why you're not losing that much weight, if at all, is because of one of these four things. And if you guys need help, if you're trying to figure this out, I'll link to the show notes, reach out to us, lastingweightlossnow.com so that we can get you scheduled for a free consultation, guys. If you enjoyed this video, check this one out here. One of my favorite approaches and structures towards fasting, towards metabolic disease. It's my program. We put it all together. We'll see you guys later.